Chapter 7, Lucanon. This is the great deep sea song that all the St. Paul seals sing when they are heading back to their beaches in the summer. It is a sort of very sad seal national anthem. I met my mates in the morning and oh, but I am old. Where roaring on the ledges the summer ground swell rolled. I heard them lift the chorus that drowned the breaker's song. The beaches of Lucanon, two million voices strong. The song of pleasant stations beside the salt lagoons. The song of blowing squadrons that shuffled down the dunes. The song of midnight dances that turned the sea to flame. The beaches of Lucanon before the sealers came. I met my mates in the morning. I'll never meet them more. They came and went in legions that darkened all the shore. And o'er the foam flecked offing as far as voice could reach, we hailed the landing parties and we sang them up the beach. The beaches of Lucanon, the winter wheat so tall, the dripping crinkled lichens and the sea fog drenching all. The platforms of our playground, all shining smooth and worn. The beaches of Lucanon, the home where we were born. I met my mates in the morning, a broken, scattered band. Men shoot us in the water and club us on the land. Men drive us to the salt house like silly sheep and tame. And still we sing Lucanon before the sealers came. Wheel down, wheel down to southward. Oh, Guvarusko, go and tell the deep sea viceroys the story of our woe. Air empty as the shark's egg, the tempest flings ashore. The beaches of Lucanon shall know their sons no more. And then chapter eight, Ricky Ticky Tavi. At the hole where we went in, Red Eye called to Wrinkle Skin, hear what little Red Eye saith, Nag, come up and dance with death. Eye to eye and head to head, keep the measure, Nag. This shall end when one is dead, at thy pleasure, Nag. Turn for turn and twist for twist, run and hide thee, Nag. Ha! The hooded death has missed. Woe betide thee, nag. This is the story of the great war that Ricky Tiki Tavi fought single-handed through the bathrooms of the big house in Sugali military camp. Darzi, the tailor bird, helped him, and Chuchundra, the muskrat, who never comes out into the middle of the floor but always creeps around by the wall, gave him advice. But Ricky Tiki did the real fighting. He was a mongoose, rather like a little cat in his fur and his tail, but quite like a weasel in his head and his habits. His eyes and the end of his restless nose were pink. He could scratch himself anywhere he pleased with any leg, front or back, that he chose to use. He could fluff up his tail till it looked like a bottle brush, and his war cry as he scuttled through the long grass was, ricka ticka 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 One day, a high summer flood washed him out of the burrow where he lived with his father and mother and carried him kicking and clucking down a roadside ditch. <clears throat> he found a little wisp of grass floating there and clung to it, to it till he lost his senses. When he revived, he was lying in the hot sun on the middle of a garden path, very draggled indeed. And a small boy was saying, here's a dead mongoose, let's have a funeral. No, said his mother, let's take him in and dry him. Perhaps he isn't really dead. They took him into the house and a big man picked him up between his finger and thumb and said he was not dead, but half choked. So they wrapped him in cotton wool and warmed him over a little fire and he opened his eyes and sneezed. Now, said the big man, he was an Englishman who had just moved into the house. Don't frighten him and we'll see what he'll do. It is the hardest thing in the world to frighten a mongoose because he is eaten up from nose to tail with curiosity. The motto of all the mongoose family is run and find out. And Ricky Ticky was a true mongoose. He looked at the cotton wool, decided that it was not good to eat, ran all around the table, sat up and put his fur in order, scratched himself and jumped on the small boy's shoulder. Don't be frightened, Teddy, said his father. That's his way of making friends. Ouch, he's tickling under my chin, said Teddy. Ricky Ticky looked down between the boy's collar and neck, sniffed at his ear, and climbed down to the floor where he sat rubbing his nose. Good gracious, said Teddy's mother, and that's a wild creature. 
I suppose he's so tame because we've been kind to him. All mongooses are like that, said her husband. If Teddy doesn't pick him up by the tail or try to put him in a cage, he'll run in and out of the house all day long. Let's give him something to eat. They gave him a little piece of raw meat. Ricky Ticky liked it immensely, and when it was finished, he went out into the veranda and sat in the sunshine and fluffed up his fur to make it dry to the roots. Then he felt better. There are more things to find out about in this house, he said to himself, than all my family could find out in all their lives. I shall certainly stay and find out. <clears throat> he spent all that day roaming over the house. He nearly drowned himself in the bathtubs, put his nose into the ink on a writing table, and burned it on the end of a big man's cigar, for he climbed up in the big man's lap to see how writing was done. At nightfall, he ran into Teddy's nursery to watch how kerosene lamps were lighted. And when Teddy went to bed, Ricky Ticky climbed up too. But he was a restless companion because he had to get up and attend to every noise all through the night and find out what made it. Teddy's mother and father came in, the last thing, to look at their boy, and Ricky Ticky was awake on the pillow. I don't like that, said Teddy's mother. He may bite the child. He'll do no such thing, said his father. Teddy's safer with that little beast than if he had a bloodhound to watch him. If a snake came into the nursery now? But Teddy's mother wouldn't think of anything so awful as that. Early in the morning, Ricky Ticky came to early breakfast in the veranda, riding on Teddy's shoulder, and they gave him banana and some boiled egg. He sat on all their laps, one after the other, because every well-brought-up mongoose always hopes to be a house mongoose someday and have rooms to run around in. And Ricky Ticky's mother, she used to live in the general's house at Sugali, had carefully told Ricky what to do if he ever came across men. Then Ricky Ticky went out into the garden to see what was to be seen. It was a large garden, only half cultivated with bushes as big as summer houses of Marshall Neal rose, roses, lime and orange trees, clumps of bamboos, and thickets of high grass. Ricky Ticky licked his lips. This is a splendid hunting ground, he said, and his tail grew bottle brushy at the thought of it. And he scuttled up and down the garden, sniffing here and there till he heard very sorrowful voices in a thorn bush. It was Darcy, the tailor bird, and his wife. They had made a beautiful nest by pulling two big leaves together and stitching them up the edges with fibers, and it filled the hollow with cotton and downy fluff. The nest swayed to and fro as they sat on the rim and cried. What's the matter, said Ricky Ticky. We are very miserable, said Darcy. One of our babies fell out of the nest yesterday and Nag ate him. Hmm, said Ricky Ticky. That is very sad, but I am a stranger here. Who is Nag? Darcy and his wife only cowered down in the nest without answering. For from the thick grass at the foot of the bush, there came a low hiss, a horrid cold sound that made Ricky Ticky jump back two clear feet. Then inch by inch out of the grass rose up the head and spread hood of Nag, the big black cobra. And he was five feet long from tongue to tail. When he had lifted one third of himself clear of the ground, he stayed balancing to and fro exactly as a dandelion tuft balances in the wind. And he looked at Ricky Ticky with the wicked snake's eyes that never change their expression, whatever the snake may be thinking of. Who is Nag? He said, I am Nag, the great God Brahm. Put his mark upon all our people when the first cobra spread his hood to keep the sun off Brahm as he slept. Look and be afraid. He spread out his hood more than ever, and Ricky Ticky saw the speckle mark on the back of it that looks exactly like the eye part of a hook and eye fastening. He was afraid for a minute, but it is impossible for a mongoose to stay frightened for any length of time. And though Ricky Ticky had never met a live cobra before, his mother had fed him on dead ones. And he knew that all a grown mongoose's business in life was to fight and eat snakes. Nag knew that too, and at the bottom of his cold heart, he was afraid. Well, said Ricky Ticky, and his tail began to fluff up again. Marks or no marks, do you think it is right for you to eat fledglings out of a nest? Nag was thinking to himself and watching the least little movement in the grass behind Ricky Ticky. He knew that mongooses in the garden meant death sooner or later, 
for him and his family, but he wanted to get Ricky Tiki off his guard. So he dropped his head a little and put it on the side. Let us talk, he said. You eat eggs, why should I not eat birds? Behind you, look behind you, sang Darcy. Ricky Tiki knew better than to waste time in staring. He jumped up in the air as high as he could go and just under him whizzed by the head of Nagaina, Nag's wicked wife. She had crept up behind him as he was talking to make an end of him. She heard, he heard her savage hiss as the strike missed. He came down almost across her back, and if he had been an old mongoose, he would have known that then was the time to break her neck with one bite. But he was afraid of the terrible lashing return stroke of the cobra. He bit indeed, but did not bite long enough, and he jumped clear of the whisking tail, leaving Nagaina torn and angry. Wicked, wicked Darcy, said Nag, lashing up as high as he could reach toward the nest in the thorn bush. But Darcy had built it out of reach of snakes, and it only swayed to and fro. Ricky Ticky felt his eyes growing red and hot. When a mongoose's eyes grow red, he is angry. And he sat back on his tail and hind legs like a little kangaroo and looked all around him and chattered with rage. But Nag and Nagaina had disappeared into the grass. When a snake misses its strike, it never says anything or gives any sign of what it intends to do next. Ricky Ticky did not care to follow them, for he did not feel sure that he could manage two snakes at once. So he trotted off to the gravel path near the house and sat down to think. It was a serious matter for him. If you read the old books of natural history, you will find that they say that when the mongoose fights the snake and happens to get bitten, he runs off and eats some herb that cures him. That is not true. The victory is only a matter of quickness of eye and quickness of foot. Snakes blow against mongoose's jump. And as no eye can follow the motion of a snake's head when it strikes, this makes things much more wonderful than any magic herb. Ricky Ticky knew he was a young mongoose, and it made him all the more pleased to think that he had managed to escape a strike from behind. It gave him confidence in himself. And when Teddy came running down the path, Ricky Ticky was ready to be petted. But just as Teddy was stooping, something wriggled a little in the dust, and a tiny voice said, Be careful. I am death. It was Karate, the dusty brown snakeling that lives on the dusty earth, and his bite is as dangerous as the cobra's, but he is so small that nobody thinks of him, and so he does the more harm to people. Ricky Ticky's eyes grew red again, and he danced up to Karate with the peculiar rocking, swaying motion that he had inherited from his family. It looks very funny, but it is so perfectly balanced a gait that you can fly off from it at any angle you please. And in dealing with snakes, this is an advantage. If Ricky Ticky had only known, he was doing a much more dangerous thing than fighting Nag, for Karate is so small and can turn so quickly that unless Ricky bit him close to the back of the head, he would get the return stroke in his eye or his lip. But Ricky did not know. His eyes were all red and he rocked back and forth looking for a good place to hold. Karate struck out. Ricky jumped sideways and tried to run in, but the wicked little dusty gray head lashed within a fraction of his shoulder and he had to jump over the body and the head followed his heels close. Teddy shouted to the house, Oh, look here, our mongoose is killing a snake. And Ricky Ticky heard a scream from Teddy's mother. His father ran out with a stick. But by the time he came up, Karate had lunged out once too far, and Ricky Ticky had sprung, jumped on the snake's back, dropped his head far between his forelegs, bitten as high up the back as he could get hold, and rolled away. That bite paralyzed Karate, and Ricky Ticky was just going to eat him up from the tail in the manner of his family at dinner. But he remembered that a full meal makes a slow mongoose, and if he wanted all his strength and quickness ready, he must keep himself thin. He went away for a dust bath under the castor oil bushes while Teddy's father beat the dead Karate. What is the use of that? thought Ricky Ticky. I have settled it all. And then Teddy's mother picked him up from the dust and hugged him, crying that he had saved Teddy from death. And Teddy's father said that he was a providence. And Teddy looked on with big scared eyes. Ricky Ticky was rather amused at all the fuss, which of course he did not understand. Teddy's mother might just as well have petted Teddy for playing in the dust. Ricky was thoroughly 
enjoying himself. And we'll finish that chapter when I see you again. Bye-bye.